We're live, Dwayne. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second edition of the Online Heritage Show and Tell. My name is Dwayne Wilkin, and I will be your host today as we drop in on communities around the province who are standing up for local history and culture. Preserving and sharing the history, heritage, and cultures of English-speaking Quebec has been the main mission of the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network since our founding in the year 2000. Today, we are pleased to count more than 100 historical societies, museums, and cultural organizations among our members, along with hundreds of individual supporters. Each in their own way reminds us that history and culture have room for us all, no matter who we are, where we live, or what language we speak. For the last several months, I've had the privilege to work with 11 member organizations chosen to participate in year two of Quan's ongoing project series, Belonging and Identity in English-Speaking Quebec. I think you'll agree that the range and quality of programming that they've developed in their communities is once again, very impressive. Over the next half hour, and a, over the next hour and a half rather, we're going to see and hear how music inspired heritage projects in both Montreal and the Laurentians. We'll also find out about ongoing efforts to document and share the history of the vanished Irish community of Montreal's Mile End neighborhood. We'll head out to the Gaspé to speak with the organizer of a long awaited cultural festival that brought English and French speaking Gaspésians together after many months of pandemic restrictions. We'll meet the founder of Quebec's virtual genealogical society and the team behind a combined research and digital learning project dedicated to the memory of First World War soldiers. Out in the Eastern Townships, we'll hear from a historical society that has been turning their own research into video podcasts, and from another working to complete an ambitious public mural project despite COVID setbacks. And we'll get a sneak peek at an upcoming museum exhibition about everyday life in the border town of Stansted that is based on oral history interviews with local seniors. We'll also learn about a project to uncover the township's little known black history, which culminated earlier this month in a lecture and launch of a new outdoor installation at Bishop's University. Finally, we'll journal, journey to Hudson on the Ottawa River, where a rare historic map of Lower Canada became the inspiration for a museum display and an online exhibition. I should say at this point that none of these projects would have been possible without generous funding from the Secretary for Relations with English-speaking Quebecers. Support for the Belonging Project has enabled Quan to directly invest $100,000 in grassroots learning, conservation, and commemorative activities over the last two years. I know I speak for today's presenters and many of you watching from home when I say that we are very grateful for this investment in English Quebec's culture and heritage. I would also like to express my gratitude to Lorraine O'Donnell and her colleague, Lena Shumarova, who are with the Quebec English Speaking Communities Research Network, Quesgrin, at Concordia University. You see, Quan is just one of several different organizations who currently receive funding through the Secretariat. Our partners this year include the English Language Arts Network, the Black Community Resource Center, Seniors Action Quebec, the Educational Resource Network Learn, and the youth group Y4Y. We all, rely, we all rely on Lorraine and Lena to handle important behind the scenes administrative duties, and they do so effectively and cheerfully. Now, just a few more words of thanks before we get started. Volunteers are the lifeblood of our communities. So on behalf of Quan, a big thanks to all of you who are helping to support community-based history and culture wherever you live. Maybe you're a researcher with a local historical society um, or active in heritage conservation. Maybe you're a teacher who goes the extra mile to bring local history and heritage into the classroom. Or perhaps you are among the many thousands of Quebecers who help fund community history and cultural institutions each year through private donations and subscriptions. Without your support, we would not be here today. Once again, I wish to thank my colleague, Glenn, Glenn Patterson, who is working the controls today as always to keep things running smoothly 
We are much obliged, Glenn. So without further ado, let me introduce our first presenter, Justin Burr. Justin is a volunteer board member with the history group Mile End Memories and a partner in this year's Belonging and Identity Project. Justin, over to you. Good afternoon. So Mile End Memories has been studying the um, Montreal neighborhood of Mile End since 2003. Um, although we like to say we're a history group and also an active community group in the sense that we uh, like to get involved in local neighborhood issues uh, with the intention of giving people information from the history of the neighborhood to help make better choices for the future. My land is reasonably well known, but let me say a few words about it. A neighborhood in central Montreal best known for bagels and its biggest employer, the video game company Ubisoft. The name is one of the oldest English place names in Montreal. It goes back to about 1805. Mile End has been known over the centuries for its country inn, its racetrack, its quarries where the gray stone for building much of Montreal was extracted, its French Catholic Church of 1858, which was at first the only church in a wide radius. After the Canadian Pacific Railway's first transcontinental line was built in the 1880s, Factories soon followed in the 1890s. When the electric streetcars started running in the 1890s, Mile End also gained an upscale commuter suburb planned by developers from Toronto. After the First World War, it was the most important Jewish neighborhood of Montreal, where Mordecai Richler was born and where he grew up. After the Second World War, Mile End was the most multicultural area of the city with Greek, Italian, Portuguese, Yiddish, and many other languages often heard. Later, artists and musicians made it home, and now the housing prices are a little too high for comfort. Among all that variety and change, Myland in 1915 was the site of the largest English language Catholic parish in Quebec. And so Myland Memories has launched a project called In Search of Irish Mile End. Uh, so there's St. Michael's Church, St. Michael's and St. Anthony's these days because it was later merged, but uh, St. Michael's then, very distinguished building, a very different building, um, designed by local architect Aristide Beaugrand Champagne in a style borrowing from medieval Constantinople and Venice using brand new early 20th century concrete technology. The church has been largely Polish since the 1960s, hence the St. Anthony's merger. By its appearance, casual observers think it must be Eastern Orthodox or even a synagogue or mosque if they don't notice those crosses on the roof line. But no, it was built from Mile End's once very numerous Irish community. The parish primary school is visible just to the right of the church, that uh, brown low building. Two decades later, uh, sorry, two decades earlier, pardon, and a few blocks north, where Jean Talon Market now stands, the first trace of Irish Mile End was laid out, the lacrosse stadium of the Shamrock Amateur Athletic Association. Here in the open fields with nothing around, the Shamrocks actually had to wait four years for the streetcar lines to open before they could move their games here from their previous rented home in Westmount. An Irish real estate broker, banker, and diamond merchant, James Baxter, was active in the area and may well have tipped the club off about the fabulous land investment opportunity. In any case, the club played here from 1895, and slowly over the years, the Irish population in the area grew in both the commuter suburb and the factory workers' rows of duplexes. I should mention that the Irish of my land were not only Catholic, even though the Catholic parish, of course, is the biggest building. Um, there were Anglican, Irish, and probably members of the, of the various Protestant churches in the neighborhood as well. But as the Irish community gradually moved away during the mid-century, the mid-20th century, even the memory of my land as a place where many Irish Montrealers once lived faded away. So that's why we've gone looking for some indications of how this happened. I'm not going to tell you about it now. I'll be giving a talk on Sunday, March 13th at our local public library, the Mordecai Richler Library on Park Avenue. And also it'll be on Zoom. Um, there will be an article in Quan Heritage News um, and also on the Mile End Memories website. And later in the year, once the weather's nice, we'll offer some my Irish Mile End walking tours based on a preview that I did last fall. So look out for Mile End Memories. We'll be announcing all these things on our website 
on our Facebook pages, um, with Colin, of course, and um, in our email newsletter, which you can sign up for on the website as well. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thanks very much. That's great. Um, I just wanted to add that Justin and his group organized a walking tour of some of the more significant um, highlights of the Irish community last fall as part of this project as well. Um, next up, uh, we're going to shift time. We're going to go back in time about a century or so, I think, and a little bit west of Mile End, all the way out to the Greenwood Center for Living History. And I'm going to invite Karen, Mel Karen Molson, who is a volunteer board member with Greenwood, to tell us a little bit about her project. Karen, are you there? Can you turn on your microphone? There were two unmute buttons. I pressed the wrong one. Can you hear you me can, now? Yeah, start your video as well. Okay. Hello, my name is Karen Molson. I'm a member of the board of directors at Greenwood Center for Living History. There we go. And I'm one of four people who have been working together on this initiative. We're calling it In This Place at that time. I am pleased to share our project with you today. Although this looks like a map, it is technically a plan. The original, created in an office in Quebec City, was an enormous undertaking at five meters east-west by two meters north-south and showed more land survey information than any Canadian document had before 1795. The smaller version at Greenwood, although only a copy from 1915, is of course an artifact itself we were curious about the history of the original. Change slide. How did this plan come to be discovered among the collection of archives at Greenwood? You can see Greenwood's location on this plan, part of the scenery of Vaudreuil, which was mostly populated by French tenant farmers at the time. Greenwood is among very few early 18th century homes in this area still intact today. We speculate that the plan belonged to Phoebe Nobbs Hyde, the final resident of Greenwood, who passed away in 1994, willing her home to the Canadian heritage of Quebec. Because of her own historical roots, Phoebe exhibited a strong sense of belonging to a predominantly English-speaking community within Quebec. Here is a simplified map of what this area looks like today. Greenwood is located in Hudson, Quebec, on the east end of the town. The district is referred to as Como. For 25 years now, Greenwood has been a museum and place of living history. The homestead bridges time from the French regime into British rule. We learned that the plan's purpose was multifold, to delineate the border between Upper and Lower Canada, to verify the existing scenarios and to create townships, to integrate over 10,000 English speaking immigrants into the Eastern townships and the Ottawa River's North Shore. In other words, the plan was directly related to land settlement, to integrate mainly United Empire loyalists, or as they were often referred to by the French Canadian majority in the assembly, les Yankees. The original plan was drawn by land surveyor Samuel Gale and draftsman Jean-Baptiste Duberger. So while this explains the original purpose of the plan, our purpose for the plan is twofold. First, to conserve it for posterity. Second, to make it accessible to all online. So when we speak about conservation, we will be having the artifact professionally treated. It will be pressed to flatten folds, rips, creases, and small tears will be repaired, and the document will be framed and put on display at Greenwood. And second, we are creating an interactive version that will be accessible on our website and exist independently of Greenwood. To that end, the plan has been digitally scanned. A glossary, timeline, and points of interest will be provided 
all content of which will complement the Ministry of Education history curriculum for secondary three. Within the interactive version, there will be various additional elements. These will include a glossary where the terms explained will relate to both our research, which includes topographic and technical terms, and the Quebec history curriculum. The timeline spans a period of time from the beginning of British rule to the granting of the townships. This is also in line with the curriculum. Throughout the plan, we have a series of 30 different points of interest with corresponding information. Users will click on the point and will then access more information, including an image or photo where pertinent. These points can be cultural, social, geographical, economic, or historical in nature. They are meant to provide an enlightened perspective and understanding. The plan serves as a conduit from the past to the present with an historical connection to the strong British roots in Hudson, be they from overseas or from across the southern border. It lends itself to an understanding and appreciation of our local culture then and now. According to the 2016 census, the majority of Hudsonites are third generation and English speaking. Some can trace their roots to the early settlers. By studying the plan and reflecting on its raison d'etre, our mission is to demonstrate how an historical artifact provides an explanation of the past and connects it to an understanding of the present. Thank you for your time and interest. Thank you very much, Karen. That's great. I, I'm so I'm so excited to see that you've put the, the focus on developing uh, tools that, that could be used by teachers uh, to tell to in, and, and, and who could incorporate some of this information into their own uh, classrooms uh, curricula. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a constant uh, goal of our network and a lot of our members to be able to influence uh, some of the education around history that goes on in, in, in Quebec. Uh, to bring that local component, to bring that community component to the classroom. Um, it also uh, fits quite nicely with our next presenter, um, since the, this map um, is so critical in understanding the uh, early days of the, of the English regime in Quebec. It's fitting that our next speaker is Fabian Ville, uh, Executive Director of the Eastern Townships Resource Centre. Um, the ETRC has undertaken probably the first attempt at a scholarly understanding of the history of Black communities in the Eastern Townships, which incidentally uh, go right back to the beginnings of Lower Canada as well. So I'm going to let Fabian take over at this point. Uh, Fabian, you're up. Well, thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for having me. Uh, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Thank you, Glenn uh, and Quan, for organizing this. It's always good seeing you all. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that the Eastern Townships are situated on the unceded ancestral territory of the Wabinaki Nation, the Natakina. For those who, who don't know the Eastern Townships Resource Center, just let me say a few words. Uh, we are located on the beautiful Bishops University campus in Sherbrooke. And as a regional archive center, our mission is to preserve the region's Anglophone heritage. The center's slogan, discover your past, is representative for this mission, being an archive center that preserves and shares it uh, proactively with the community. Uh, while our archives are really concentrating on the acquisition of private archives related to the English speaking community, uh, the overall mission and mandate of the ETRC is meant to be inclusive of all communities in the Eastern Townships. And the ETRC sees it as its responsibility to go beyond this, the grand narrative and to include the perspective of groups that, that have not always been the authors of their own history. 
um, past events and exhibits, conferences, I tried to shed light on the townships, indigenous groups, or for example, Jewish immigration. And with this approach, the ETRC bridges past, present and future, and wants to be a contributor for the ongoing vitality of the Eastern Townships patchwork communities. It is with this inclusive understanding that we propose to Quan and the Secretariat uh, the exhibit project Black Histories in the Eastern Townships. For this project, the ETRC teamed up with researcher Dr. Sunita Nigam as an external consultant who came up with the wonderful exhibit on which we worked almost nine months. It was launched uh, in, in the beginning of February, very timely to kick off Black History Month uh, this year. The Black history of the Eastern Townships is often glossed over by historians and popular understandings of history alike. And yet, the townships have been an important territory for Black history in the Americas. Black, hist Black Histories in the Eastern Townships proposes a collection of historical snapshots that shed light on important chapters in Black history of the region. That includes slavery, the Underground Railroad, Blackface minstrel performances, sport cultures, the jazz scene in the 1920s and 50s, and also changes to the linguistic and cultural demographics of the Black population in the townships. And today we talk also about the Black activist movements in the townships that we see. The material archive of Black life in the townships is very fragmented and incomplete. Moreover, Black people have seldom been the authors or protagonists of official histories in the Americas. This is why very early in the exhibit, we talk about the lost archive. Even us at the ETRC as a regional archive center, we do not possess images that illustrate Black life in townships history. So much of this community has gone unrecorded, making it difficult to illustrate and exhibit. But we also sensed it relevant to include voices from the Black community from today. And one way by doing this and bring these two things together was by integrating contemporary art in the exhibit and fill the gap of historical documents. Rather than proposing a definitive or complete history, Black Histories in the Eastern Townships is an unfinished work, an unfinished work that extends an invitation to viewers to con continue to fill the gaps in the collective memory of Black life in the region. It is a call for participation. This exhibit hopes to plant seeds for future conversations, research, activist intervention, and artistic responses. As such, the exhibit Black Histories in the Eastern Townships turns towards the past to ask questions about the present. What can the, the Black Histories in the Eastern Townships teach us about how and by whom the region has been shaped over time? Or about the reality of Black life in the townships today? And how can we respond to, to these histories from the perspective of now. Duane uh, already mentioned that uh, the exhibit has two components. It's a physical exhibit, which is on display at the moment at Bishop's University campus, and it will be there till March 18. And then we will start to tour around the townships with this exhibit. So if you're involved with a local heritage organization and you would like to host this outdoor exhibition for free, uh, just get in touch with me. The second component, that's what you see on the slide, is the online exhibit. I invite you all to, to visit black-histories.com and have a look for yourself. With this project, I would like to encourage uh, you maybe and also other organization, organizations to give marginalized groups and communities a voice and show their contribution to our modern and open society in Quebec. So thank you again for supporting this project uh, and to contributing to the community's cultural and historical vitality in the townships. Thank you. 
Thank you, Fabian. What a beautiful project. Uh, you know, I, I have not yet made it out to Bishop's campus to see the physical exhibit, but it looks so attractive and well set up. Good job and uh, so congratulations to you and to Sunita, Thank whose you. lecture was excellent, by the way, uh, a few weeks ago. Our next presenter, staying in the townships for a moment, is Jane Jensen. Jane is a volunteer board member with the Société d'Histoire de Canton d'Arfour. And uh, she is going to speak about research that she has taken to the next level uh, involving media products. Uh, we're all getting very familiar with that now. So Jane, without uh, delaying any further, I'll pass the mic over to you. <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks, Dwayne. Um, and uh, I want to begin by um, starting my video. Um, <clears throat> so I want to uh, begin by uh, thanking Quan for the support uh, for our project, <clears throat> both last year's project and this year's project, two of which are, uh, as you'll hear, uh, closely related. Um, so I'll begin with um, the um, <clears throat> uh, a little bit of background on the History Society um, in Orford. It's um, a history society that studies the history of a linguistically mixed um, township uh, settled uh, both by um, Anglophone, English speaking and French speaking um, settlers uh, from the beginning of the 19th century. The members of the uh, History Society are overwhelmingly uh, uh, francophone uh, and um, they uh, uh, have a, a significant interest in understanding the history of both linguistic communities. I also want to um, change my slide <clears throat> by uh, sort of positioning Orford a little bit because it may be one of the less known townships it's, um, so the municipality is in the um, uh, regional municipality of uh, Memphremagog. It covers the western part. Now its boundaries have been reduced. So it covers the western part of the original township that in 1801 extended as far as Sherbrooke and included half the town. In the 19th century, it was in uh, Sherbrooke County uh, and uh, the, the municipality circles Mount Orford on three sides. The History Society was created in, in 2019 and therefore has had to adapt its uh, activities uh, to the uh, COVID times, which has been most of our own history. We have a very active website, which is designed to reach beyond the township and the townships uh, and the addresses there. Our members have produced a number of publications, some of which have had major launch events. When possible, we've organized outdoor activities and the picture on the right of your screen shows uh, the um, publicity for one of our most popular outdoor activities, which is a tour uh, by a surveyor uh, covering a, a, a portion of the surveyor's um, uh, report and explaining to uh, the participants how uh, surveying worked in the uh, early 19th century. In 2021, uh, we had three uh, Quan projects um, that were funded. And again, we uh, thank uh, Quan for that uh, funding. The most important one in terms of our investment was a, a virtual tour uh, an interact, uh, with an interactive site, somewhat like the one we just saw for Hudson. Uh, we produced a map and uh, a number of documents uh, with information about each of the points on that map. Uh, this was bilingual material accessed on a computer, tablet, telephone, and posters in various places with um, QR codes. Nonetheless, the um, uh, wonderful as it was, the virtual tour had only a limited reach. So in 2021, we uh, decided to produce eight video podcasts, uh, four in each language. These are more complicated to produce because uh, technical expertise is necessary, but they're also very useful. And we think they might be a model 
They're a very useful outreach tool for a little history society like ours that has no archives, no phone, and access only to a few photographs. So what we're going to do for the rest of the time today is present you with a partial uh, uh, part of one of our uh, video podcasts, and I'm going to pass it over to um, uh, Grant to uh, set that up. Along with the other beautiful lakes in the region, Boker Lake was an early attraction for visitors from south of the international border as well as Quebecers. Several groups built camps around the lake to take advantage of its excellent fishing and hunting. The Boker Lake Club built the first camp in the 1920s. This group of 12 sportsmen came from Lebanon, New Hampshire, and White River Junction, Vermont. Each of the 12 contributed a small amount of capital to launch their adventure. Their members chose the lake shore in the southern bay of Boker Lake for their camp. They purchased the land from William Ewens, a well-known local businessman and manager of the Eastman Hardwood Lumber Company. In the 1930s, Boker Lake seduced another group. Started up in 1913, the Granby Fish and Game Club originally had its camp on Stukely Lake. 20 years later, however, the members bought land and moved the camp to the northeastern shore of Boker Lake. Members' families took turns staying at the camp during their summer holidays. During the rest of the year, the sportsmen used it for fishing and hunting. Thanks very much, Glenn. Um, and uh, thanks again to uh, Dwayne for organizing the event. Thank you, uh, Jane, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, we are all becoming more and more aware of the need to master these media skills. Um, it seems that uh, there are so many different platforms out there for telling stories that we have no choice. Even as small though may, we may be in our in our local communities, uh, but to get on the bandwagon and learn how to use this, these tools. So hats off to you and also to Denny Tremblay. I know that Denny has joined us today and. I believe that he was your, um, your, your technical person. All volunteers, amazing. We're going to pause from our, our, our presentations at this moment because um, I would like to introduce uh, the man and who is kind of behind the organization that is uh, funding all of these projects. His name is William Flock and he's the Assistant Secretary of the Secretariat for Relations with English Speaking Quebecers. And uh, he's asked uh, if he could be a part of today's event to say a few words. And I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Bill uh, to join us. Bill, over to you. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Um, I'll try to be quick because these are very fascinating presentations and I don't want to take too much uh, away from it. But um, I just wanted maybe to um, provide a couple of contextual remarks for the Secretariat and the way we're working uh, with QSPRAN and with the uh, various partners that uh, Dwayne outlined uh, previously. Um, so just to, to remind us kind of where the initiative came from, from our point of view, um, in the fall of 2019, uh, we traveled around Quebec, uh, uh, my team and myself, as well as uh, um, Christopher Skeet, uh, the, the uh, response staff and in the, in the Premier's office. And uh, along the way, we were trying to get a sense of what the priorities and needs were for English speaking Quebecers. And one item that emerged that we didn't really have an answer to at that point was that feeling of a sense of belonging and some of the, the challenges that uh, related to, to that, uh, uh, that issue. And um, 
from there, we, we started to interact with various uh, organizations to, to try to figure out ways that we could reinforce that sense of belonging for English speaking Quebecers. And out of that came this project. Um, so we, we're now hopefully negotiating a, uh, a third version of it, so it's a, a third one year uh, agreement um, using uh, Lorraine O'Donnell and, and Hugh Scram uh, at Concordia as an entry point. Uh, but as, as Wayne pointed out, um, we've got uh, some really strong networks that are, are partnering together and with us to take up parts of this challenge, uh, including the Quebec Angel and Heritage Network, the English Language Arts Network, Black Community Resource Center, uh, Seniors Action Quebec, Youth for Youth, um, Learn Quebec. Uh, I hope I haven't forgotten anybody in that quick tour. But um, what, what we really like about this approach is that um, each of those organizations, uh, for the most part, tends to be a kind of a head of a network and then can reach out to its members and mobilize them. Um, so we, we calculate that through this project, um, there are, uh, including uh, some of the schools where there's activities going on, uh, there's 80 to 100 centers across Quebec that are um, mobilizing um, their, their efforts to uh, deepen our understanding, uh, celebrate a part of English language, uh, culture, and history, um, and, and you know some of the various things you've heard today. So we, we're very pleased um, at the partnerships that we're building uh, with Quan and with the other groups I've mentioned. And um, we, we feel that this way of working gives us uh, the ability to really see a, uh, an impact across Quebec. So um, I, I think I'm, I'm going to stop there with just the last comment is that um, as a graduate of bishops with uh, an honors degree in history, you can you can count on my active interest in the kind of stories that you're telling here today. Um, I've learned some things already. I'm looking forward to, to the next set of it. Um, and uh, I, I think that um, the fact that this is being recorded and that people are, are looking at other ways to to share the word and, and disseminate uh, uh, through through different means. Uh, bravo to all of you. And the fact that we've accomplished so much in a period where, for the most part, we've been living under the, all the restrictions and challenges of the pandemic. Um, it, it's really a, a testimony to people's uh, energy and goodwill to uh, to get on with the work, I guess. So um, uh, thank you, Dwayne. I'll, I'll turn it back to you and I look forward to the uh, rest of the presentations. Thanks, Bill. And um, I think if I heard correct, we are can expect uh, support from the secretary for a third year uh, of projects. Um, and I think that will be good news for members of our network. Uh, we can perhaps follow up with that at the end of the day. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make that clear that uh, if it's coming, we're very pleased to be able to uh, help our members um, carry out their activities and their mission in their local communities. So we're going to move on now to uh, Montreal, and um, I think Caitlin has joined us. Uh, the I don't know. Are, I hope that many of you here, or if not all of you, are aware of the Canadian Center for the Great War. Um, this is a very special institution. I won't get into the history of it because I'm afraid that I might I might screw it up. But um, we're very fortunate to have uh, the curator, Caitlin. Bailey and her assistant Zachary Mitchell here today to discuss a very interesting project that they developed with the uh, belonging and identity funding this year. Um, essentially, it's all about the first war, but it's all about the people and the faces of the first world war who were from Quebec communities. So I, I want to let uh, Caitlin introduce uh, Zachary, who will then give us a tour of their project. Caitlin, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Dwayne. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, um, the Canadian Centre for the Great War is um, exactly as its name states. Uh, we are a social history organization based in Montreal, and we look at the uh, effects of the Great War on Canadian society, and particularly on Quebec society. So we've worked with um, Quan for many years. We're very, very lucky and very grateful for the funding that we've received uh, for this particular initiative, uh, which my colleague Zach is going to go into in greater detail. Um, Picturing Quebec's Recruits was a, a project that we've um, been looking at for quite some time, uh, trying to essentially 
draw up an idea of who exactly were the people uh, in Quebec who volunteered uh, to serve in the First World War. Um, so Zach, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Zach, I'm not sure you might need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Always some, always some technical issues. Adds a little bit of fun to things. Um, it seems no matter how many times I use Zoom, there's no getting around it. So as Caitlin uh, mentioned, one of the uh, topics which we really wanted to address with this project, Picturing Quebec Recruits, which you should be able to see uh, in the screen share right now, is really you know, coming to grips with who were the, the um, men who were the volunteers and the conscripts from Quebec uh, in the First World War. So we adopted a two-pronged approach in this examination, in this project. Uh, so on the one hand, we really wanted to delve into some of the more quant uh, quantitative data, some of the more like more of the demographic profiles. And then on the other hand, we wanted to look at the stories. So I'll just walk everybody through um, that in a bit more detail and then show off the exhibition a bit. So in terms, <clears throat> in terms of the quantitative side of things, uh, we put together a sample of 60 soldiers from our collection who we were able to um, identify as residents of Quebec before the war. And then we uh, ran through uh, a number of uh, uh, a number of measures essentially to try and answer the question, well, who were these men? To try and build a bit of a picture, uh, a bit of a profile of what sort of the average Quebec recruit um, looked like. And obviously there are limitations here because of the sample size, but nevertheless, it did offer some uh, very basic insights into you know, who these men were. Um, some of our findings weren't particularly surprising. So for example, we found over the course of this research that about 70% of our sample were single when they, uh, when they enlisted. Um, obviously marriage is, is, was a strong deterrent for enlistment. And this was all the more pronounced in Quebec, which had the country's highest marriage rates at this time. But other assumptions or other findings rather um, ran much more counter to our assumptions. So for example, when we were looking at the average age of recruits, we actually found that the average age of our recruits was 27 years old. Uh, and that while there was a bit of a correlation with uh, between your age and where you'd serve, you know, whether you would end up in, for example, a frontline unit like the infantry or a more auxiliary formation like the uh, railway troops or the forestry corps, it wasn't qu quite so cut and dry. Um, so there were some very, very interesting dynamics at play there, which this quantitative analysis let us let us see. But of course, just looking at numbers doesn't do justice to to these men. So we then wanted to go a step further and look at some of their stories. Um, so as I you know, briefly touched on, the Canadian Expeditionary Force was a very, very large organization with a number of different units uh, serving all sorts of purposes. So you know, the story of two men, even if they attested on the same day in the same town, could be really drastically different. So to this end, what we did is we developed an interactive map, which we really envisioned as the focal point of the exhibition. So I'll just quickly walk you through how to get there from the exhibition. This is the landing page. And then from the menu, you can click on by the numbers. And then by using your mouse wheel to scroll, you actually can move through first the quantitative analysis I was just talking about before ending up here at an interactive map. Um, presently, it has the stories of 10 different Canadian soldiers, but we have plans to expand that further to 14. There's just some, some last little finicky details to sort out on our end before we can get there. Now, I'm not going to go into details about all their individual stories for the sake of time. Um, what I will say is that there was a great deal of variety to be found, and that really is the main takeaway. Um, some served in France, others remained in Canada. One wound up in Siberia, oddly enough. Uh, and so by really looking at their stories in more detail, you can get a sense of just the sheer variety. Um, you know, There wasn't a singular narrative, a singular story of what it meant to, be, to, to serve in the First World War. Taken together, it is our hope that this project can serve as the starting point for further research, particularly looking at local communities across the province. This is a typically neglected area of research, sadly, so we really hope that this can serve, um, can, can invigorate this area and that further projects, further research can be done to develop our understanding. Thank you very much. 
uh, to Duane for organizing this event and to Quan for your support and funding for this project. And thank you to everyone in attendance today. It's really great to see so many people here. Thank you, Zachary. And uh, I'll just say that I hope that we'll have more to say on this uh, uh, idea of expanding this wonderful project to other communities across Quebec. Caitlin has been working on an idea. I know that it's getting ready to be announced soon. Um, it's really lovely to see a spin-off from a belonging project um, get to that stage, but I'm gonna let Caitlin um, get her idea out if she can stay with us uh, to the end of the session. We'll have, a, I hope to have a bit of time at the end of the session for questions and answers. Um, our next speaker is Doug Simon. Doug is the president of the Morin Heights Historical Association. Um, if you recall, I mentioned that we would have um, some projects dealing with musical heritage in Quebec. Well, one of them is the project that has been uh, developed by the Morin Heights Historical Association. I won't say any more, except that this is a really cool project for anybody who grew up in Quebec and listened to um, pop music and rock music. Um, Doug, I'll let you take it from there. Thanks, Wayne, and, uh, and thanks to Glenn for coordinating all of this, and of course to Kwon for staging it. Um, located in the Laurentians, Morin Heights is a, a unique in that it's officially bilingual and has an inordinate amount of, um, of musical talent. Uh, as a tourist destination from the early 1900s, live music has always been an important feature. Uh, 20s through the 50s, uh, big band and square dance music uh, was filling the, the many hotel bars and dance halls. And then in the 60s, uh, things switched over to rock and roll uh, right through the 90s. Uh, the most famous of all of the rock venues was the Commons Hotel. And uh, uh, you could see acts like Blue Rodeo, uh, Ronnie Hawkins, Jeff Healy, Edgar Winter, uh, Corey Hart, and many others, Down Child Blues Band. Um, in the 70s, folk music uh, uh, arrived big time and Rose's Cantina was a small coffee house, uh, a coffee shop, featured performers, per, uh, performers like Jesse Winchester, Penny Lang, uh, Chris Rawlings, Bill Russell, Karen Young, and others. Uh, live folk music, uh, it, it's everywhere in Morin Heights. Uh, through the 90s, we had the Wild Roots Festival, and now we have Super Folk, which is a week long, weekend long celebration of traditional and modern folk music. For 20 years, Le Studio was one of the most famous recording studios in the world, bringing big name artists such as uh, Rush, the Bee Gees, Cat Stevens, Robert Charlevoix, uh, Chicago, the Police, and, and many, many others uh, who would come to record and uh, live in the, uh, uh, in the accommodations right on site. And they just loved being here uh, because they were out of the glare of media and fans that you had in a big city. Um, during that time, you could see these people walking around town and rubbing shoulders with folks down at the commons uh, as they were uh, watching music and sometimes jumping in to jam a little. Now, the, the reputation uh, of the town as being a music spot, as you were, um, attracted many musicians and people who just love music. Uh, taking up residence uh, in, in the area and mixing in and becoming part of the social fabric of the uh, uh, of the town. Uh, Robert Charlevoix has lived here for many years. Uh, Neil Pert, the drummer for Rush, uh, took up residence here, unfortunately passed away about three years ago. Now, music is such an important part of our local history that we decided to produce a documentary film titled Music, the Language of Warren Heights. Um, we're going to take a little break and uh, let you folks have a look at the trailer. Enjoy. C'est une chanson qui s'appelle Morin Heights. Found myself in wicked ways. I lost myself in women's arts. I bought some security. On the bed of nails in Morin Heights. <laughs> <laughs> 
la langue officielle, vraiment officielle de More Night, c'est la musique. Je suis parti comme un rebelle Envoûté par des... Quand, quand j'écris, j'essaie toujours de mettre une, une certaine profondeur de, de l'attachement que j'ai envers euh, Morn Heights. I'll always be there for you. He said, I want you to write a song about how much I love my daughters, and it should have this line in it. Well, I'll always, I'm always there for you. The people that knew our music liked our music, and uh, and I still play, uh, you know, some Zydeco and uh, a lot of. Uh, Uh, Louisiana-based sounds. Foolish you, you want to go away. We are bound, we are bound for the We start at 21 again. I'm yeah. Gonna... You have this nature around you that is like a piece of artwork that you're enjoying every day. J'aime beaucoup aussi le, le calme de l'endroit où je reste. I live by the river and there's a lake close by and I'm working on music on the harp that is trying to reflect um, all of the different elements of water. The place was just a rocket. It was a magical place, I'm telling you. Pretty massive set of drums. And to jam, and I think it's happening again with the super folk, people are coming here. Vive Mara Night. Oui. Yeah. C'est la raison pour laquelle... Yeah. Vive Mara Night, il ne faut pas dire ça, les gens vont aller visiter, on n'aura plus la paix. That's super. That's super, Doug. Did you, did you, I, I just want to ask you one thing. I mean, it was it's such a trip down memory lane uh, watching those clips. When will the film be out? Okay, well, I, I was going to wrap up by saying that it will be available later this summer. Um, it, it coincides with our 25th anniversary and we'll have local presentations. We're going to be offering it uh, Uh, to school boards, uh, to uh, any local organizations who want to use it and municipalities and um, uh, media outlets like Kojiko's uh, New TV. Um, it's a completely bilingual film with uh, subtitles in, uh, in the opposite language. Um, it's been made possible by a terrific talent of local videographer Dan Foyer and by the support of Quan, and we thank you very much for that. Um, we hope that it'll be an educational tool and a lasting tribute to our musical heritage. Uh, there will be a larger article uh, in, in Quan Heritage News. Thanks so much for sharing the, the trailer with us, Doug. Much appreciated. St staying with the musical theme for a moment, and I think it's appropriate, we're going to jump back to Montreal and meet Sebastian Schulman 
who is the executive director of CLES Canada. I don't know how many of you have heard of CLES Canada, but this is a, a really interesting organization that focuses on the klezmer music and Yiddish culture generally, um, as it uh, Montreal being one of the, the centers for Yiddish culture for many, many decades of the 20th century. Um, and uh, this organization uh, sponsors, uh, uh, puts on uh, workshops for musicians. It sponsors uh, festivals, uh, retreats, co concerts. It's a, it's a wonderful, interesting organization that Quan first connected with a couple of years ago during our Different Tunes project that uh, Glenn Patterson was running. So I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to let, let Sebastian Schulman uh, tell us about their project and their organization. We're going to start with dancing a little bit, just in your chair, wherever you happen to be. Uh, well, I want to start off just with a very quick thank you uh, to Dwayne and to Glenn, uh, everybody at, at Con, and uh, you know for including us in, in the network and in this event, and uh, for your wonderful wonderful support. Uh, so, Clez Canada, thank you, uh, Dwayne, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, is indeed one of the centers uh, in North America for klezmer music, uh, Jewish arts, and Yiddish culture, uh, and our home is 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 here in Quebec, in Montreal. Uh, and I wanted us to take a moment to contextualize a little bit uh, how this community came uh, to, to Montreal. Uh, so Yiddish speakers came en masse to Quebec, primarily to Montreal, uh, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, immigration to North America was uh, one of the answers to the so-called Jewish question, uh, a time when uh, Jews in Eastern, Europe's, Eastern Europe were struggling for, for rights, uh, looking for economic opportunity, escaping different kinds of persecution. And Montreal was one of the places uh, that, that these immigrants came to en masse. Uh, and they built here a community which was peripheral, at least in, at the start, in terms of global Yiddish culture, but was quite uh, robust in the institutions they were able to build. To build. Uh, and uh, Yiddish was for a long time the third language uh, of Montreal for much of the 20th century, uh, sometimes called the Third Solitude. Uh, and in between this religious divide and this linguistic divide, uh, Jewish immigrants, Yiddish-speaking immig immigrants, built a network of really incredible institutions, many of which are, are still with us today. Uh, I name a few of them here. The Jewish Public Library, which was sort of a people's university. Uh, the Kenneth at Oblid, which was a, uh, a daily newspaper. You can see the masthead here. Uh, and it was very particular, particularly named the Canadian Eagle, uh, emphasizing its rootedness in, in the local landscape. Yiddish newspapers tend to have names like Unzer, Unzer Zeit, Unzer Show, Unzer Folk, which means our time, our people, our hour. Uh, but the Montreal newspaper was rooted in Montreal. Uh, there was and is a network of schools uh, where Yiddish is, is taught and spoken, literary salons like the one led by the incredible poet Aida Maza, whose photo you can see here. Uh, and even though this was a robust Yiddish-speaking community, uh, before the school system in Quebec was uh, divided by language, it was divided by religion between Anglo uh, ang mostly Anglophone Protestant schools and Catholic schools and Jews. Uh, were brought into the Protestant school system and at least Ashkenazi Jews, Yiddish speaking Jews really became an Anglophone community. Later waves of Jewish immigration from elsewhere uh, really became Francophone, but the, the Yiddish speaking Jews uh, very much became an Anglophone community. Uh, after the war, uh, Montreal as a place for Yiddish went from a peripheral but robust place to a very central place in global Yiddish culture. And it's a, it's a place we still hold today. Uh, there was an influx of Holocaust survivors uh, and there's this sort of pun joke that these were the cosmopolitan. Uh, a polit in Yiddish is a refugee. The cosmopolitan were the cosmopolitan refugees. Uh, and they built a network of institutions on top of the existing network uh, 
the Dora Wasserman Yiddish Theater is a community Yiddish theater, still exists, a network of schools which have been called utopian in the way that they've preserved uh, Yiddish language and culture in Quebec. Uh, Hasidic communities, ultra-religious communities have found a home here. Uh, different ways of expressing yourself creatively. You can see this theater festival that happened about 10 years ago. We'll talk about Plays Canada in just a moment. And what's quite incredible about the place of, of Yiddish culture in Quebec is it's rich, it has this rich legacy, but it's so normal. It is part of the fabric uh, of Jewish life in Montreal uh, and elsewhere in Quebec uh, in a way that is, that is unique in North America. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to share some of that with you today. So where does CLES Canada fit in? Uh, CLES Canada was, was founded in 1996 uh, as a place that both taught traditional Jewish arts and Yiddish culture, but also nurtured its growth. Uh, and we are uh, a very diverse community of people. We welcome Jews of all kinds, secular, religious, uh, old and young, but we also we uh, welcome a diversity of, of non-Jews. And we started as a very small summer festival, but as uh, Dwayne so rightly uh, uh, mapped out, we do activities all throughout the year. Uh, and we had one of our very, very first in-person events uh, supported uh, by Khan and the, the Secretariat uh, this past uh, autumn. Uh, so that was that was very exciting. Just want to take one moment and sort of go a bit more granular uh, and look at our flagship event, which is the summer retreat. Traditionally, in, in non-COVID times, takes place in the Brentians uh, at Camp in Abrith, a Jewish summer camp. And uh, this is uh, an immersive week-long festival uh, that sort of just plunges people into every aspect of this culture, all kinds of people, artists, scholars, amateurs, students, families, seniors, youth, everybody, uh, into every kind of artistic expression. Uh, and uh, you know, it's rooted in values of access, making this, this culture accessible to a diverse array of people, not just from here, but from all over the world and from every age and background. Uh, and if there's one thing I'd like to sort of share from our experience uh, as a heritage organization, you know, we're dealing with a culture that because of the dislocations of, of uh, migration, uh, genocide, of course, the, the Holocaust looms large in our history. This tradition is no longer passed down uh, in a family context for most of our community. Uh, you can't live in a Yiddish speaking neighborhood the way you used to. Uh, so some scholars, and I, I list some of their names here, have looked at the way that Klez Canada is passing down this, this tradition. And they, they do call it the Klez Canada method. Um, so we emphasize informal, but very rigorous learning of music and art uh, where hierarchies are broken down at the summer retreat Everybody is living together in a very rustic, uh, not very fancy sort of landscape and, and environment. And so, you know, you're eating and going to the bathroom and, you know, with the greatest practitioners of this culture, uh, and you get to know them in a very intimate way. Uh, and through that kind of connection, mentorship and apprent apprenticeship sort of naturally uh, come about. Uh, and that's the core of, of what has been called the CLES Canada method. Uh, other sort of aspects to it, building a common vocabulary. How do you talk about this culture? How do you enter it? Uh, allowing people to enter it from any artistic discipline they, they uh, are involved with, they love, whether as professional or just a, a lover of culture. Uh, and it's importantly not salvage work. This is not reclaiming a culture that has been destroyed uh, you know, in, in the war, in the Holocaust, but rather making sure this culture has space to, to grow and breathe and thrive, thrive uh, and making that experience uh, of learning, of, of, uh, of creation uh, accessible for people uh, and affordable. And one of our major initiatives is the Azrieli Scholarship Program, which makes the program, uh, makes the retreat, I should say, and, and other programs we do uh, affordable and accessible for, for younger people. Uh, and if I want to bring this all together and, and make one, one last, give one last thought, 
Uh, it's the, the importance of intangible heritage for, for Les Canada and for our community. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, you know, we talk about being the people of the book, uh, but we also play, place a, a tremendous uh, value on the oral tradition. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we talk about material culture in a, in a Yiddish context, uh, it can mean many, many different things. Uh, and uh, just underscoring the importance of the fact that heritage can take, can take many forms, as we've been seeing from all these fabulous organizations uh, today. So I will leave it there uh, with a little bit of music. Thank you very much. Merci. Hashem and Dan. Wow. Thanks so much, Sebastian. I, I've lived here all my life, and Quebec still surprises me with the, the kind of interesting and creative people that live and walk amongst us. Um, thank you for your work. Thank you for those excellent thoughts. Uh, I think they apply to so many of the groups who belong to the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. And uh, maybe one day I will be able to make it to a CLES Canada event in person. I'd love to. Now, our next speaker is Joanne Gervais. She is a volunteer board member and really the guiding light and founding uh, member of the Quebec Genealogical E-Society. She was my contact a few weeks ago when I spoke at their recent uh, four day long uh, virtual conference Joanne, I'm going to turn things over to you to tell us a little bit about your organization and your recent conference. Thank you so much, uh, Dwayne and um, Glenn, for organizing this. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Um, also, I'd recommend, um, Joanne, just speak a little bit louder. I think your mic's a bit quiet. All right, sure, no problem. I guess I'll have to share my screen. I thought you were sharing my screen for me, Glenn. No, it's on you. <laughs> All right, uh, here we are. So the Quebec Genealogical E-Society um, is not everyone really knows what it is. So I'm gonna just very quickly talk about who we are, why we were created and what our focus is. So we are a nonprofit organization. We are totally virtual uh, society. We have no building, we have no roof, we have no walls and we are focused solely on Quebec ancestral research. We launched in February to, uh, 2018. So actually this month is our fourth anniversary. So there are two groups of uh, folks that we're really um, interested in attracting. And these are the people that most physical genealogical societies don't reach. And these two groups are the Quebec Genealogical E-Society uh, targets. Our first target, those who can't visit a physical genealogical society. And why can't they visit? They can't visit because maybe their genealogical society is too far away. They have to actually get in a car and drive to a society. They have to, and, and myself in particular, was um, I fell into one of those categories where I was driving an hour to a society to uh, do some research, an English society to do some research and an hour back. So I spent most of the time in the car, especially if it was during rush hour. And they can't visit a society because the society is ours. That doesn't ac accommodate their needs. Maybe they're working. Uh, they're not retired as some of us are. Uh, maybe they have a family and the opening hours of societies doesn't accommodate uh, their schedules. Or they can't visit a society because the society wasn't accessible to them, didn't have wheelchair ramps, didn't have an elevator, et cetera. Joanne, I'm just gonna stop you for a sec. Can you click, um, you know, see where it says from beginning on your PowerPoint up in the top left? So we're just seeing the first slide. We're not seeing your slideshow. We're just seeing the, 
the sort of editor mode. There you go. So click that. And um, where you can also just select the slide that you're on from that left hand pane and that, that'll do the trick as well. Are you not seeing my slides now, Brian? I see why we were created, but what you weren't in the slideshow mode. You were just um, hanging on the first um, slide and you were in the editor mode, not in the slideshow mode. It was, uh, it was stuck, so I was actually moving my screen. It's all right, not a problem. So we're on why we were created right now. We were created and uh, the cat visit because it may not be accessible to them. And our second target are those who won't visit a physical genealogical society for various reasons, meet and greet is not their cup of tea perhaps, um, or um, uh, their society doesn't fit their uh, connective lifestyles. They live in a digital environment where they want access to information at their fingertips, uh, 25, 24 hours per day, seven days a week um, when they are available. So um, our society was created, our mission is to provide Quebec-focused genealogical services for both the can't, people that can't visit a society and won't, regardless of where they live in the world. And how do we do that? Um, we've done that by re replicating a visit to a physical genealogical society in a virtual world. Um, and I won't go into all the uh, services that we offer, uh, however, I do want to say that we are the only uh, virtual genealogical uh, society in, in Quebec providing a, a wide range of services to our members, and we're the only virtual genealogical society focused solely on uh, Quebec research in the world, I believe. Um, but I also want to say that, um, and I want to emphasize, that our mission, our intent, is not to replace all the wonderful societies and archive centers and historical societies out there in the world. We can't do that because that's so valuable to people. What we, what we uh, do want to provide is services to the folks um, who, want, who want to better understand their Quebec heritage, who don't live in the province of Quebec or can't travel um, to a, a particular area, Eastern Townships or Montreal or wherever. And finally, I'd like to thank um, the Belonging and Identity Project for uh, supporting us in our virtual genealogical conference that we just completed a couple of uh, two weeks ago. And without your support, we could not have provided this uh, wonderful opportunity to all of our members. Um, and I just want to give you some examples of um, what our conference contributed to the local knowledge, culture, and diversity of, um, of Quebec and our, and our heritage. We had so many wonderful speakers, so many experts in their field, um, Indigenous crossbreeding at Shellar Bay and Gaspé, Mohawk communities of Akwesasne, Kanesataki, and Kanawaki. I won't go through them all. The Irish in Quebec, the uh, um, French Protestant genealogy, uh, uh, the, uh, the Wyndham County Loyalists, et cetera. These are some of the diverse topics that we provided to the public from people in Quebec and all across Canada and all across the United States who attended um, uh, trying to, um, trying, uh, uh, searching for their Quebec identity and belonging and uh, wanting to better understand their heritage in the province of Quebec. So it, it really, it really was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful five days and thank you so much um, for Quan and the Belonging and Identity Project. Without you, we could not have done that. We had over 700 registrations in those five days from folks all across, uh, all across the country. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne. Uh thank you, Joanne. Um, right. Yeah, I wasn't aware of uh, jo Joanne's organization until a couple of years ago, um, and uh, was very, been very impressed with all the resources that uh, she's managed to put online and make available to this wide membership. Um, we're gonna we're we're behind running behind time a little bit, so I'm sorry to hasten things up, but we're gonna jump right away to uh, we're gonna go out to the gas bay now, and and we're gonna meet with Anne Nober, who is a project coordinator with Vision Gas Bay Per Se Now. It is a community organization uh, based in Douglastown, 
And Anne, I'm going to let you take it from there to explain um, what you did this year as your Belonging and Identity Project. Hi, everyone. Can everyone see me? Yes. Yes. Uh, all right, because I just wanted people to see my face. I enjoyed seeing people's faces before the presentation. So that's me, but I'll just share my screen right now. So here we are. And oops, let go. So I'm very happy to be here today to tell you a bit more about uh, what we did in Douglastown uh, last September. So it was a the Gaspesian Way Festival that happened that was held in Douglastown in September 2021. And um, so here you can see our happy faces. These were my wonderful partners for, for this festival. Dave Felker on the right, I am Anne on the left, and Isabel is in the middle. She was Douglas Community Center director. So it was a, a great success. More than 300 people came out to take part in, uh, in, in the, the, the festivities. And this community gathering had been long awaited. Of course, people hadn't had a chance to gather for an event for about 18 months. But in Douglas Town, there was something more. Uh, um, and I'll tell you a bit more in just a minute. And for us organizers, of course, uh, we experienced a roller coaster of emotions uh, planning an event during COVID. And uh, we were very unlucky with the weather. Uh, it was uh, for the festival, it was absolutely miserable. It was stormy, extremely wet. And uh, as you may know, with uh, vaccine passport checks, we, there were lines. So people were literally waiting in the rain to be able to enter our facilities. And uh, it was, uh, but they, they showed up and uh, everybody was happy in the end and it made all of our efforts worth it. So what it meant for us at Vision Gatsby per se now, uh, this festival in September, 2021 was really the fruit of, of, uh, of two years of work, really. Uh, all of the networking and the coordination, the two years I had spent building relationships relationships with artists and artisans, it finally paid off. People trusted us, they trusted us, tr trusted us enough to come out. And uh, it was a, yes, a great turnout. So the Gaspesian Way and its festival series, let me tell you just a, a bit more about the Gaspesian Way. It's a, it's a very new brand. It uh, publicly came out right during COVID in maybe in April, 2020. And the brand's goal is to highlight and showcase Anglophone Gaspesian artists and artisan, whether online, of course it started online only. And uh, now we are starting with in-person activities and events. And last September, there were three festivals all around the Gaspé coast, uh, one in Chigawak, one in Douglastown and one in New Richmond. So, oops. I mentioned that it was a long awaited, um, very long awaited event. Why is that? Of course, there was COVID involved, but there was uh, really something else. It's because the English speaking community here in Gaspé um, had been waiting for an event for years. I'm not saying that there were no festivals near and around Gaspé for years. I'm just saying that the Anglophone community did not really identify with those festival. Um, and so historically, there were two major festivals, the Irish Week and the Wacom York Homecoming Festival, which was legendary. People were coming back home from all over the country for this, but sadly they, they stopped uh, a few years back. So yes, in September, 2021 in Douglastown, people were finally able to come to an Anglophone festival. And we were able to bring Francophones and Anglophones together. That was another uh, big success. We were so um, grateful that many French, many French organizations um, 
came out to present their services to Anglophones. And uh, yes, Vision, Vision Guest Paper say now, uh, I, I, wish, I wanna say thank you to all the people who came out, to all of the organizations, and of course to Quan who helped us with the festival through its Belonging and Identity Project uh, funded by the Secretariat. Now I wanna share this picture with you because it's really, um, that's, to me, it's, it's a picture that I love. It was taken in the Holy Name Hall, which is a, a historical hall right in the village in Douglas Town. It's a gem, really. Um, so it's, older generations have a lot of memories in that hall. There used to be cinemas and lots of events during their youth. And sadly, newer generations don't really have the opportunity to go in there that much. Um, because of uh, building repairs and just it's ongoing, but it was a chance to be in there. And you can see the, um, the Douglas Town Dance Orchestra here. So I like it because you can see that generations meet and that traditional knowledge is passed on. What's next for us? Uh, more activities for um, under the Gaspesian Way banner, and uh, we mean regular activities, but also special events and festivals. And our goal is really to nurture creativity and create a sense of belonging to really promote culture as a powerful tool for Anglophone pride and sense of belonging. <clears throat> and um, VGPN will of course continue to support informal, informal culture. And by that, I mean, here on the coast, there is a very big difference between Francophones and Anglophones. Francophones have more professional artists and Anglophones have a bit less of them, but we and Francophones <laughs> agree with that. Uh, more Anglophones actually have cultural hobbies. So our community organization is very proud to support that. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, and congratulations. Our next speaker is Norma Husk. Norma is the president of the Richmond County Historical Society. And Norma's uh, organization was involved in year one of the Belonging and Identity Project, but the project has been beset with setbacks due to COVID. And in addition to that, uh, Norma has been working with the indigenous community of Odenak to come up with a, a trilingual uh, interpretation panel as part of her year two uh, project. Um, I don't wanna give away too much of her talk, so I'm gonna let her speak now. It's a very interesting, and, and for a, a member of the English speaking communities, Heritage Network, I, I think uh, almost a historic uh, uh, event to commemorate um, Richmond's uh, surrounding populations and different cultures who live in the area uh, by bringing in uh, an, indigenous, an indigenous community to, to help with that uh, process. It's been a, been a big learning experience, as I'm sure Norma will tell you. Norma, over to you. Hi there. Uh, so Richmond County, um, our historical society, we're really grateful uh, to be a part of Quans and the English Secretariat to Belonging and Identity Project, and of course, a recipient of funding from them. Uh, we've been working in partnership with the Richmond uh, St. Pat Society to really make this project a reality. And while our main focus has been the creation of a historical mural in a downtown, uh, on a downtown building next to a municipal park, Today's presentation is going to be on the interpretation panel that's an, an integral part of that uh, project. So I'll just take a, a few seconds to remind viewers that our mural is uh, created by Raphael Coulomb Ali of Mur Mura in Sherbrooke. And it celebrates the groups of people who, for whom Richmond is, uh, Richmond the area is home. We uh, begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the Wabanaki Nation. And we have been working with community leaders to incorporate Abenaki language and elements of cultural symbolism into this mural. To this end, uh, we had initially foreseen having all of the panel's text uh, available in Abenaki, French, and English. 
uh, and we have only really uh, partially proceeded in this vein. Uh, there are a number of reasons uh, for this change. First, our, um, our attempt to avoid repeating colonization practices. Uh, we chose not to uh, have a direct translation for our colonizer text. Rather, we asked if the communities of Odenak and Wallenak would uh, like to share some of their history on their, la on their land with us, and they have done so. Uh, we remind our audience and we acknowledge that Indigenous history is oral history, and it's passed on mainly through storytelling and the visual images that hold meaning and memory. Abenaki history has been shared with us in this manner, and we are most grateful for these contributions. In addition, it's important for us to remember that much of the Abenaki language was lost through colonization practices. And the relatively small communities um, of this nation, Odenak and Wallenak, are working to revive and share their language. We look forward to sharing inauguration festivities with representatives of the Wabanaki Nation at the launch of our mural this spring. I'm going to share with you now, I can manage to share the screen here, um, oh, our, um, a, a picture of our mural, more or less, I guess we could say. So we'll start from the beginning. Uh, we are, this is obviously just to set the stage for, um, for our presentation. This, what you are looking at, oops, what happened there? What you're looking at here is a, a close approximation of the murals image and it will be um, reproduced on the interpretation panel. Uh, we included historically relevant uh, pictures, uh, pictures of uh, cultural life, the agricultural fair, uh, the St. Patrick's Parade, as well as things like the railroad uh, and farming that were central to the area's uh, development. Uh, we can look, see as well uh, bridges, past and present, and uh, we can see that we are, we've depicted the life of Abenaki uh, in the past uh, with um, the canoe, and, but also today's recreational use of the river uh, with the kayaking club that we have here. Uh, the woman in, that's central to this, uh, to this image, it holds a basket of flowers and these flowers uh, represent each of the main ethnic groups that contributed to the area, as well as indigenous symbols of sweet grass and strawberries. The Celtic cross uh, represents the Celtic peoples who settled here. And if we can go further, we will see that how we are planning to this interpretation panel of each of these numbers of the items will be explained uh, in English, French, and for those images that are relevant to Abenaki culture, uh, information will be provided in that language as well. The banner at the top of the mural welcomes people, uh, all people on Abenaki uh, territory. Uh, the outside board of the interpretation panel will feature images of the rising sun. The Wabanaki Nation are known as people of the rising sun. Sturgeon and lynx representing the people of Odenak and Wallenak, respectively. Uh, black ash baskets that were traded and sold by the Wabanakiak for centuries. So uh, that's our interpretation panel. And we've been really grateful to uh, Kwan and the English Secretariat for their support for over this last couple of years. We plan to launch this when the weather permits uh, this spring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norma, and congratulations. Good work. We look forward to the, the inauguration of that mural uh, later this spring. Our final presenter of this afternoon is Kathy Curtis. Kathy is archivist at the Colby Curtis Museum in Stansted. As I mentioned in my introduction, 
The Colby Curtis Museum is uh, developing an exhibition this year based on oral histories collected in the community. And Kathy's going to tell us a little bit, a little bit about that project, as well as share some of the uh, amazing uh, sound from one of the tapes that was made hmm, a couple of decades ago, I guess now. I'll let uh, Kathy take it from there. Kathy? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dwayne and Glenn, for all your help. So I'm happy to be with you today, and I'm going to tell you about our oral history collection. In 2012, the late Harry Isbrucker approached one of our dedicated archive visitors and volunteers, Marguerite Dunlop, and asked if she'd be interested in doing some oral history interviews. This was the one thing that our archives was seriously lacking. Marguerite jumped on board, and after finding the correct equipment to use, she began her quest for seniors, meeting people at different functions and activities around the area. Marguerite, with the help of her husband, Peter, was able to conduct around 20 interviews, some individuals and some couples from all over the area from different backgrounds and walk of life. Sometimes it took some convincing that not everyone has a story and others volunteered more willingly. These people were a majority, if not all, seniors who have lived very different lives, but sim very similar also. They shared memories of their youth and growing up and how times were the good ones, the sad ones, and the hard ones. Marguerite touched on subjects of transportation, going to school, and once they got there, what subjects they liked. Their friends and names of favorite teachers, a majority of our interviewees attended one-room schoolhouses or the Holmes Model School here on the grounds of Stansted College, with many continuing their education at Bugby Business College, also on the grounds of Stansted College. Many grew up on farms. The family raised and grew their own food. They share memories of how their fathers made their living, how they traveled, and sometimes even by train, shopped in local small stores, and what a treat it was to have a piece of candy. Some share their memories of war. There are so many different memories. And we also have a few veterans who tell the story of their service. Others remember what it was like hearing about it on the radio and the rations and how they would get the things they needed. We have one interviewee that happens to be my mother-in-law, Louise. She tells what it was like being a young child growing up in Sweden and going through practice drills and blackouts and having gas masks hanging on the wall. Some married soldiers, and when they returned, and this leads me to Nellie Buzzell Hudson. Nellie grew up in Magog and married her soldier, Herbert, when he came back from war, but he was not the soldier she was originally engaged to. Glenn? They got a beautiful old organ in there, you know, pipe organ. Were you married in that church? I was seeing. We were, I ran away and got there. Oh, dear. Oh. You were running away I from the other fiance? Oh, <laughs> no kidding. Boy. No. I went to Waterloo and got married in Waterloo you didn't want by to the ready? Reverend Mitchell. Oh, okay. Do you ever hear of him? No, should I have? Uh, yes, should because uh, the Mitchells were in Magog at one time at the United Church. Okay. Yeah, I was married in the United uh, Church. Church. Yeah. So, so why did you run away? You didn't want a big wedding? Well, because my par father didn't want me to uh, go out with Car with the Herb. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to wait for Carl. Oh, okay. And uh, so I was 22, so yeah. I figured I had a mind of my own on okay. Mary who I wanted. <laughs> I bet you had a mind of your own all the way along from the age of six or seven, yeah. So anyway, uh, we ran away to walk. I was working in the office at Dominion oh, Textile at the time. Okay. And so uh, this Saturday morning, I took the little train from Magog to um, oh, Foster, then from Foster to Waterloo. And my cousin was living in Waterloo okay. at the time. And so I went to her house. And her met me there, uh -huh. and we got to the Reverend Mitchell to come over and wow. uh, <laughs> and marry us in the house. Well, it worked out, right? Then we spent our honeymoon in the Waterloo Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't go very far, no, then, eh? we didn't. No, no.
There are so many memories to share with you today, but Nellie's story is interesting in its entirety. Another memory that our local music, another memory that is that of our local music. So many look forward to Saturday nights in Fitch Bay, Cannon Guston Hall, listening and dancing to Sam Hopper and Albert Nut Brown, or going to the fur farm and dancing the night away with Jim Belknap and his band, all part of life in the townships. This spring, the Colby Curtis Museum will be having an exhibit with the working title, Let Me Tell You a Story, where you can come and listen to the selection of oral histories. This will also be part of a project in cooperation with Manoir Stansted, our local seniors residents, to go in and do more interviews and talk with our seniors and learn more of their history. <clears throat> also, during the past couple of years, we have all been a little bit lonely at times, and we hope that our project will spark a bit of joy for our seniors and also give us a sense of community history. This will be part of our oral history project and exhibit. This will happen when COVID restrictions allow. We will nevertheless continue collecting more oral histories and not necessarily just seniors. We would also like to add interviews from our Francophone community. If anyone is interested in possibly being interviewed, we invite you to contact us here at the museum. And please come and enjoy our exhibit. The dates and opening will be announced soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. What a, what a beautiful idea going into a local senior's home to collect stories and then work with them to reflect those stories back to them in a, in a, in a, in an exhibit that they can that they've actually participated in oral history is you know seems to come and go in popularity over the years many of our groups have have done oral history projects in the past but i think there's always a always a need to remember that it's the stories that are at the center of the work we do and we need to listen uh, to those stories more often so i thank you for your presentation today and i look forward to the exhibition that Colby Curtis is putting on later this spring. And I thank you all for taking part in today's show and tell. If you'd like to know more about our Heritage Network, please visit the website www.quan.org. You'll find listings for upcoming events, activities in English all around Quebec, plus information on how, be, how to become a member. Now, I'll also take this opportunity to mention that we hope to be able to continue with the Belonging and Heritage Project series for a third year in 2022-23 with support from the Secretariat. Lorraine has told me in a private chat message that she's still working on this. I know it to be true. So watch our website and our Heritage Line, Heritage Line newsletter for um, details on how to get involved. Uh, just a reminder, Quan's popular Heritage Talk series is now underway and being streamed online free of charge. We are pleased to count the Secretariat among our sponsors, along with the Chalkers Foundation, the Zeller Family Foundation, the Townshippers Foundation, and the Department of Canadian Heritage. Our next speaker is Sunita Nigam, uh, who will discuss her recent experience searching for archives of Black histories in the Eastern Townships. That lecture gets away on Sunday coming, February 27th at uh, 1 p.m. Then we begin the month of March with Janice Rosen from the Alex Dworkin Canadian Jewish Archives in Montreal. She'll be sharing the story of this amazing 88 year old institution. Uh, we follow with a tribute to a group of citizens who have spent the last 30 years protecting the natural heritage of Pinnacle Mountain in Broma Sisqua. Um, from there, the series continues with profiles of the Richmond County Historical Society and the Barry Historical and Heritage Society. Then it's off to Odenak First Nation for a presentation by band counselor De, uh, director Daniel Nolet, who will explore the challenges faced by the Wabanaki as they work to protect and preserve their language, culture, traditions, and history. For a complete list of our Heritage Talks, which continue right through the month of May, go to www.quan.org. That's all for me. We'll see each other again, I hope, soon, maybe even in person. Have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate it. All the um, cooperation and working with us through a little technical glitches, but 
we got everything done and everyone did a fantastic job.